we will continue with the Christmas story. Today's story is called The Most Beautiful Thing. The sides of the path were covered with rings of white snow, but in the center its whiteness was crushed and churned into a foaming brown by the tramp. Tramp of hundreds of hurrying feet, it was the day before Christmas. People rushed up and down the path carrying armloads of bundles. They laughed and called to each other as they pushed their way through the crowds above the path. The long arms of an ancient tree reached upward to the sky. It swayed and moaned as a strong wind grasped its branches and bent them toward the earth. Down below a haughty laugh sounded and a lovely fir tree stretched and preened its thick green branches sending a fine spray of snow shimmering downward to the ground. I should think, said the fir in a high smug voice, that you'd try a little harder to stand still. Goodness knows you're ugly enough with the leaves you've already lost. If you move around anymore, you'll be quite bare. I know, answered the old tree. Everything has put on its most beautiful clothes for the celebration of the birth of Christ. Even from here, I can see the decorations shining from each street corner. And yesterday, some men came and put the brightest, loveliest lights on every tree along the path. Except me, of course. He sighed softly, and a flake of snow melted in the form of a teardrop and ran down his gnarled trunk. Oh, indeed. And did you expect they'd put lights upon you so your ugliness would stand out even more? smirked the fur. I guess you're right, replied the old tree in a sad voice. If there were only somewhere I could hide until after the celebrations are over. But here I stand. The only ugly thing among all this beauty. If they would only come and chop me down, and he sighed sorrowfully. Well, I don't wish you any ill will, replied the fur. But you are an eyesore. Perhaps it would be better for us all if they came and chopped you down. Once again, he stretched his lovely thick branches. You might try to hold on to those three small leaves you still have. At least you wouldn't be completely bare. Oh, I've tried so hard, cried the old tree. Each fall I say to myself, this year I won't give up a single leaf. No matter what the cause is, but someone always comes along who seems to need them more than I. And he sighed once again. I told you not to give away so many to that dirty little paper boy, said the fur. Why, you even lowered your branches a little, so that he could reach them. You can't say I didn't warn you then. Yes, you did at that, the old tree replied, but they made him so happy. I heard him say he would pick some for his invalid mother. Oh, they all had good causes, mocked the fir. That young girl, for instance, colored leaves for her party. Indeed, they were your leaves. She took a lot, didn't she, said the old tree, and he seemed to smile. Just then a cold wind blew down the path and a tiny brown bird fell to the ground at the foot of the old tree and lay there shivering, too cold to lift its wings. The old tree looked down in pity and then quickly he let go of his last three leaves. The golden leaves fluttered down and settled softly over the shivering little bird and it lay there quietly under the warmth of them. Now you've done it. Shriek the fa. You've given away every single leaf. Christmas morning, you'll make our path the ugliest sight in the whole city. The old tree said nothing. Instead, he stretched out his branches to gather what snowflakes he could that they might not fall on the tiny bird. The young fir turned away in anger, and it was then he noticed a painter sitting quietly a few feet from the path, intent upon his long brushes and his canvas. His clothes were old and tattered, and his face wore a sad expression. He was thinking of his loved ones and the empty, cheerless Christmas morning they would face, for he had sold not a single painting in the last few months. But the little tree didn't see this. Instead, he turned his back to the old tree and said in a haughty voice, at least keep those bare branches as far away from me as possible. I'm being painted and your hideousness will mar the background. I'll try, replied the old tree. And he raised his branches as high as possible. It was almost dark when the painter picked up his easel and left and the little fur was tired and cross from all his preening and posing. Christmas morning, he awoke late, and as he proudly shook away the snow from his lovely branches, he was amazed to see a huge crowd of people surrounding the old tree. 
ahhing and owing as they stood back and gazed upward. And even those hurrying along the path had to stop for a moment to sigh before they went on. Whatever could it be? Thought the haughty fire and he too looked up to see if perhaps the top of the old tree had been broken off during the night. Just then a paper blew away from the hands of an enraptured newsboy. The fur gasped in amazement. For there on the front page was a picture of the painter holding his painting of a great white tree whose leafless branches, laden with snow, stretched upward into the sky, while below lay a tiny brown bird almost covered by three golden leaves. And beneath the picture were the words, the most beautiful thing is that which hath given all. The young fir quietly bowed its head beneath the great beauty of the humble old tree. We will continue with the Christmas story. Today's story is called the Noel Candle. It was Christmas Eve in Reims, France, nearly 500 years ago. The spires of the great cathedral towered high in the sky over a throng of people who had gathered in a square before the church, celebrating the joyous Noel. Laughing children darted through the crowd as groups of youths and maidens sang carols and danced to the music of a lute and tambourine. Everywhere faces shone with such happiness. It did not seem possible there could be. In all of Reims, one sad and lonely heart. Yet there were four. Three of them lived in a squalid old shed by the river. Though its outward appearance was dismal, the inside was neat and clean. Its one room served as living room, dining room, bedroom and kitchen for three people. But the rough stone floor was carefully swept and the patch covers on the straw mattresses in the corner were spotlessly clean. A rough table, broken chair, stool and rickety bench were the only furniture in the room. In a fair corner stood a small charcoal brazier whose weak flame served not only to cook the meals but to warm the hut. The one touch of beauty in the little room was supplied by a tiny shrine built on a shelf at the rear wall. A few field flowers in a bowl stood in front of it, and from the shelf hung a heavily embroidered scarlet sash which had once held a knight's shield. A young woman was bending over a small spinning wheel. A boy of seven was setting the table with their few cracked dishes, and a girl a year or so older was stirring a kettle over the brazier. The lady whose beauty shone through in spite of her ragged clothing was Madame la Contesse Maria de Malincourt and the boy and girl, her son and daughter, Louise and John. As she worked, the lady was thinking sadly of Christmas only a year before, when everything had been so different. Then she had lived in a great castle. And as on every Christmas Eve, she and her husband and children had gone down to the castle gate to greet the crowd assembled. The old, the ailing, and the poor would gather there and the mailing courts would go into the crowd giving to each villager gifts of warm clothing, healing herbs and food. Even Louis and Jean would give something from their own toys to the village children. Then war had swept over their happy valley. The castle had been attacked and robbed. Lady Mary's husband had been led away in chains while she and the children had fled down a secret passageway out in the night and away to the village. She found it deserted. The villagers frightened away by the attackers. During the months that followed, the three had wandered along the highway trading away their belongings, bit by bit in return for food and lodging. Even Lady Mary's coat had gone to the wife of a rich merchant. And the pretty clothing of Louis and John had been replaced by coarse peasant wear. Only one thing remained of their belongings. The cover of her husband's shield, which little Louis had brought from the castle that dreadful night. Father gave it to me to keep until he comes back. He said, and through all the terrors of their flight, he had clung to it. It was dear to all of them, for it was their only reminder of their father and the life they had shared together, said Jean suddenly, interrupting her mother's thoughts. It is Christmas tonight. Yes, sighed Lady Mare, but there will be no toys or sweets for you and little Louis the Noel. We don't need them, the children answered. We have you, mother, and we can keep Christmas in our heart. Their mother looked up at them and smiled. Yes, though life is hard, she said, we still have each other, and even though we miss your father, I'm sure there are others in Rhymes tonight that miss their lived ones also. I just wish we had something to give the poor as we once did. A thoughtful silence filled the room. Mother Jane said excitedly, I know something we can give. 
As she talked, she picked up the small tallow candle from the table and hurried to one window of the hut. See, she went on. I will put it on the sill, and perhaps someone who passes, someone like ourselves, will be happier because of this little gift of light. There. See how it shines out on the snow. You are a good child, Jan, said Lady Marie. Then, smiling gently, she resumed her work. Down in the great square, among all of the lights and gaiety, was another sad heart. It beat in the breast of a little lad of nine. A boy in ragged clothes whose bare feet were thrust into clumsy wooden clogs. He was utterly alone in the world, without money or friends, cold, hungry, and miserable. When he tried to tell his story to some of the milling people around him, no one took any interest in him, other than to frown at him or elbow him out of the way. At last, in utter despair, he began to tromp the streets, stopping now and then to gaze at the splendid houses and to seek help. But there was no welcome in any of them for the poor lonely child. It was dark in the streets of Rhymes now and the air was growing colder. But the little child trampled on, trying desperately to find shelter before the night closed in. At last, far off down by the river, he saw a tiny gleam of light appear suddenly at a window and he hurried toward it. As he neared it, the boy saw it was only a small tallow candle at the window of a hovel, the poorest hut in all Rhymes. But the steady light brought a sudden glow to his heart and he ran forward and knocked at the door. It was quickly opened by a little girl. And at once two other people had risen to greet him. In another moment, he found himself seated on a stool beside the charcoal brazier. The little girl was warming one of his cold hands in her palms, while her brother was holding the other, and a beautiful woman, kneeling at his feet, drew off the wooden shoes and rubbed his icy feet. When he was thoroughly warmed, the little girl dished up into three bowls and a crack cup the stew which had been simmering on the fire. There was only a little of it, but she passed the fullest bowl to the stranger. After a word of blessing, they ate their stew and never had the thick soup tasted so rich and so satisfying. As they finished, a sudden flowing light filled the room, greater than the brightness of a thousand candles. There was a sound of angel voices and the stranger had grown so radiant they could hardly bear to look at him. Thou with thy little candle have lighted the Christ child on his way to heaven, said their guest, his hand on the door latch. This night your dearest prayer shall be answered. And in another instant he was gone. The countess and her children fell to their knees and prayed. And there they still were many minutes later when a knight in armor gently pushed open the door and entered the hut. Mary, Jeanne, Louis, he cried in a voice of love. Don't you know me? After all these weary months of prison and battle, how I have searched for you. Immediately his family clustered around him with embraces and kisses. But father, how did you find us here? Cried little Louis at last. A ragged lad I met on the highway told me where you live, answered the knight. The Christ child, said Maria reverently, and told him the story. And so forever,